right, let's go. Okay. We're gonna run it. We're gonna run out of tape. Yep. Okay. You ready? Okay. Three, two. Welcome to the first episode, the inaugural episode of Unified, a podcast about athletics, aesthetics, and other related topics. I'm your co-host, Paul Lucas of UniWatch, and joining me through the magic of Zoom is my co-host, Chris Creamer of SportsLogos.net. Chris, are you with us? I am with you, Paul, loud and clear, and I'm very, very excited to start this new era. Finally, you know, I was wondering how long it would take for us to finally embrace this uh, audio-only medium. But uh, I'm glad that we finally did this, reaching out a, a uni olive branch, I suppose, to uh, <laughs> to unite or to uh, unify the, uh, the unifies. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I have wanted to do a podcast for a long time. And the problem for me, and I'm sure you have bumped up against this as well, is that not just my work with uniforms and logos, but a lot of the things I write about, aside from sports, are all visually oriented and it can be hard to address uh, you know, visual content in an audio format. Uh, and one thing I thought was, well, I could have guests on to talk about this or that. And I thought, God, do I want to coordinate like scheduling with all these guests? And then I thought, well, maybe I could just have a talk with somebody else who gets it. And I thought of you hmm. and I thought you and I could, you know, talk about our work uh, and the beats we cover and the, the history we have and other things that interest us that are sort of related to this work. Um, and you and I have wanted to collaborate on some project for a long time. We talked mm -hmm. about it for years. Mm -hmm. And this idea sort of hit me uh, a month or so ago and I, I proposed it to you and, and here we are. Here we are. Uh, it only took what? We've met each other about seven years ago. We've been discussing uh, things with each other for probably 15 years, maybe longer. But finally, all it took was a, a global pandemic to uh, finally make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are, we've done it. Uh, and you touched on it a bit uh, during your, your intro there. Um, but you and I, we don't just share interests in uniforms and logos and design. We also share interests in the unusual and perhaps some of the absurd uh, that I'm, I'm starting to notice that, you know, logo uniform aficionados kind of share these, these unusual interests. Uh, and uh, we could really deep di uh, dive deep into some of these <laughs> things and uh, discuss some of the more unusual things. Uh, we'll see where it goes, really. I mean, obviously, the focus of the show is going to be uniforms and logos uh, with, you know, co-hosts such as I. But let's not limit ourselves to those two topics. And let's start talking about some of the weird stuff that we, we all love. That no sure. one else and, understands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sort of all-purpose uh, geeky pursuits. Yes. Uh, and, you know, you mentioned that we've known each other for a number of years. And uh, I think it's worth mentioning that, that we're good friends. Mm -hmm. um, you've stayed at my house. I've spent a day with your family at the San Diego Zoo <laughs> when we were all out there to cover the Padres uniform yeah. unveiling. And, uh, <laughs> yes, you're wearing a Padres t-shirt. Uh, and I think some people may either assume or mistakenly think that we're enemies or, you know, fierce rivals or something like that. And it's true. Sometimes we're competing for the same story mm -hmm. uh, or for, for a scoop or, or whatever. But uh, I have so much respect for what you do and the way you do it. And, uh, and you've always, you know, shown the same kind of respect toward me. And I actually remember one time you, I think it was your first uh, visit to New York and I took you to Katz's, the deli uh, in the East village. Um, and as we were waiting online to check out, we had, we just had like pastrami sandwiches or something like that. It was that. amazing. And there was this, this pause of quiet. We weren't talking. There was sort of just a break in the conversation. And you looked at me and you said, I like that we're friends. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that. But. I do. Well, it, it felt like we should be friends, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if I had any doubts that you and I were friends, um, that night I slept on the couch in your house and you didn't uh, off me in my sleep. I, I think <laughs> at that point <laughs> I knew we were good. Uh, but yeah, like uh, that night at Katz's, that was amazing. Uh, you, you took me down there. Um, uh, as someone who'd never really been to New York before, uh, you going right up to the deli counter and saying, hey, give me a give me a sample of that. And the guy cuts off like half a pound of meat. <laughs> oh, here you go. And it just melts in your mouth. It was amazing. Yeah, that was uh, a, that was a good night. A very good it was night. incredible. And then afterwards, I walked home in the rain all the way up. Not home. <laughs> well, if I'd been a really good friend, I would have given you a lift or something. <laughs> that like is, that. I don't know. I enjoy that. The, the New York but, ambiance was great. 
<laughs> but that was like the sort of, the, if not the start, certainly like yeah. a key step in uh, a friendship that's led us to this point. And uh, I'm excited about this podcast. And it seems like everybody else in the world has a podcast except yeah. us. So, so, why, not so, us? so <laughs> why not us? Uh, so we have our name unified, which we had a lot of back and forth on yeah. uh, to get to that. Um, we, we need a logo. We're working on a logo. We're working on theme music. Maybe by the time this uh, episode is posted, uh, we'll actually have those or maybe not, but we decided we want to plunge ahead uh, and, and get this first episode off and running. And we thought we would ease into it uh, and into the whole podcast arena by interviewing each other and, and asking each other some things about um, our work and how we got to this point in our careers writing about uniforms and what influenced us and things like that. Um, and I don't know who wants to, do you want to start? Do, do you want me to start? Sure. I, well, I can start. I can uh, jump in here. Now, Paul, you've interviewed me once before already. That was, I think it was, um, because I did run an interview with you on UniWatch, and I remember you sent me a photo, I believe, from your of your thirtieth birthday cake. Yeah, yeah, to give you an idea like how long ago that was. As I'm as so I'm I, approaching forty. <laughs> uh, well, that's a you know that's another yeah. thing that that I think is worth mentioning here is that while we have a lot in common and we are good friends and we cover the same beat and all of that, we also have some differences that we've discussed that that might be interesting and lead to some interesting discussions mm -hmm. on this podcast uh, that I am American you are Canadian yes I'm 56 you are 38 you're 38 and so we sort of came of age in different eras of sports and and sports merchandising and and uniform and logo design so that's that's sort of an interesting difference as well to sort of generational difference mm -hmm. uh, you have kids uh, I don't and that I think probably affects uh, how we consume and perceive sports to a certain degree. I, I assume that you know the culture of sports and, and fandom is part of your household yes. in a way that it, it might not be for mine. Uh, and so all those things I think are, are really interesting, not just the things we share, but the, the areas where we diverge. Um, and so sorry, sorry to have cut off your, uh, your first question. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, and uh, before we jump into it, I want to point out to anyone listening that uh, we are going to be hosting the video feed of this on uh, the Sports Logos Net uh, YouTube channel. So if we describe something visual, we, uh, you can refer to that if, if you want to. Uh, and I bring that up because you mentioned that we differ in uh, memorabilia and merchandise and things. And my background is, is a good example of that, as is yours. Um, <laughs> I, I love your background. It's just not very sporty. The candle. No, pin. although I am wearing a jersey. <laughs> yeah, I am. What, what are you wearing? What are you wearing? This is a. Uh, um... You know, for people who are watching the, yeah. the YouTube version, so we're going to have, as Chris says, video and audio versions of every episode of this podcast. Um, I am wearing a, a vintage uh, game used softball un a jersey, part of a full uniform. I actually have the pants and the socks as well, although I'm not wearing them. Uh, from, <laughs> okay Warsaw, Missouri, from Warsaw, Missouri. And so it says Warsaw and it's beautiful green flannel, which is my favorite color. Uh, and on the back, it has um, an ad... I can't remember what it is, Chris. I'll, I'll read it out to you. The Osage Oil Company. Yeah. On, yeah. A, on a beautiful interstate style shield. Yeah. And so this is I this is what I call I don't really buy like, you know, the the teams that I root for, I really I I'm a big, big Mets fan, big, big 49ers fan, but I don't buy Mets or 49ers stuff. Um, but I do have a lot of old jerseys and uh, vintage things from high school teams, mm -hmm. softball teams, um, things that I just find beautiful in their construction and design. And to me, each one is sort of a story mm -hmm. because someone actually wore this, you yeah. know, not a famous athlete, but just some guy. Uh, and sometimes I can sort of tease out where they're from or what the team was and sometimes even find the person who wore it or find out who it was. And, and that's interesting too. Uh, like I, I find that aspect of, of apparel and uniforms uh, more interesting than the mass produced stuff, which I don't mean as like a, a knock, on the, but it's just what works for me. Yep. No, I absolutely understand that. I get that. And I mean, that's going to count as my first question. So mm -hmm. I'm good. I got that in the bag. Mm -hmm. uh, but we can uh, we'll go back. We'll, we're we're going to go back all the way to your childhood there, Paul, because that those tend to start. And when do you think you first started to notice the aesthetics in uh, athletics? And uh, <laughs> you know, what, what do you have that moment in your head like that where the light yeah, bulb I went off? 1972, I was eight years old, and that was really the year 
that I first paid attention to sports like the whole year. I remember I watched the 71 World Series, but I hadn't watched the season leading up to it in, in any particular you know, devotion or anything like that. But in 72, I started uh, collecting baseball cards. Um, I followed that whole baseball season. I watched, you know, a lot of Mets games on TV. And I grew up on Long Island, which is part of the New York TV market. So we got Yankees games too. Mm -hmm. And so you could see the American League as well as the National League. We take for granted now that you can see pretty much any game. But in, but in those days, it, you know, it wasn't so easy. And so growing up in and around New York really made a difference. And I absolutely noticed the uniforms. Like I connected strongly with not just the logos and the, the, you know, the scripts uh, insignia across the chest of a jersey, but also how the different players wore their uniforms. And especially, uh, and this will come as no surprise to anyone who has read UniWatch, I was obsessed with baseball stirrups because for one thing, there was nothing else like it in any other sport. No other, like every sport has a jersey or a shirt. Every sport has pants, but only baseball had this sort of ornamental hosiery or I didn't know that term then or I wouldn't have used but the, you know the, these this thing that the players wore on their their shins that weren't quite socks they didn't seem to have a function aside to be from being decorative mm. and no two players wore them quite the same because the amount of white that showed underneath the stirrup was a little different for every player and the players cuffed their pants at a slightly different level as well and that fascinated me that it was sort of the least uniform part of the uniform, but I had strong feelings about like a right and wrong way to do it. There was sort of like a, a golden ratio or a platonic ideal of having just the right ratio of color to the white under sock, uh, you know, the sanitary sock and of just the right level where the pants should be cuffed. And, and I totally geeked out on that. When I got my first little league uniform that same year, I was, utterly obsessed with getting my stirrups and my, my <laughs> pant cuffage exactly right. Uh, and that was really the start. And in, in the years after that, like throughout elementary school and into even into junior high, I was that kid who is, instead of paying attention to the teacher, I was doodling a lot mm -hmm. in the margins of my notebook. First, I would do a lot of logos, team logos. Like I would try to doodle I remember the Philadelphia Flyers logo. I could never get it right. Like it's the sort of perfect circle of the, yeah. that center circle that goes around the, the orange dot. I could never get it just right. Um, but I would also, and this sounds ridiculous saying it now, I would be doodling little drawings of players wearing their stirrups, like just like a, like a leg with the pant cuff just right. And the stirrups would be, oh, at this level. And then another player doing it at that level. And I'm sure it looked completely insane to anybody who you know would have looked. You know, why are you doing this? Or, or, you did, know, did, how many phone calls did the teachers make to home about? Uh, <laughs> I don't think I ever got caught doing it, but uh, it 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 was just like this little obsession I had. And uh, I mean, if only I could have. If, if anyone did question it at the time, I would have said, you know, well, obviously I'm going to grow up to write about this for a living, you know, <laughs> <laughs> which which I would not have said, and I would not have been able to predict. But it, it you know, oddly, it worked out that way. So, well, that, that's a good uh, lead into your next uh, part of your life. We're going to jump forward to you becoming a writer. And were you always a writer? Did, has, has that been your lifelong career? Like, where, how did that start? How did you get into writing? Uh, I did write for my high school paper and my college paper, uh, newspaper. Uh, there was no journalism program where I went to college at SUNY Binghamton, State University of New York at Binghamton. Um, at the time, they do have one now. Uh, there was just one journalism class in the English department, which I took. Uh, and I loved writing for the school paper, but I couldn't really see or project myself sort of from here to there, like getting to be a quote unquote real writer like working in a very tall building somewhere, yeah. you know, like that's what I would call it, like very tall building media. I couldn't imagine myself being a part of very tall building media. Mm -hmm. And so uh, like whether due to insecurity or like imposter syndrome or because I didn't have a real journalism degree or, and I still have an imposter syndrome to this day because I still don't have a real journalism <laughs> degree, uh, even though I've written for lots of very tall building media outlets. Uh, and, and you so, wrote a book. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but sometimes, you know, certain insecurities may never go away. Yes. Um, so I did what a lot of people did uh, in those in those days, which was like the late 80s and early 90s when I got out of college. 
Uh, I was working as a book editor, but I started publishing a zine. And for people who are too young to remember, maybe including you, Chris, I don't know. <laughs> uh, a zine was like a self-produced little magazine. Uh, it's short for fanzine. And fanzine started as sort of the punk rock scene and then grew into to cover everything else. And I had a zine about consumer culture uh, where I wrote about like pr products and package design and uh, industrial design and all sorts of like little excruciatingly small details of consumer culture that I was obsessed with. Right. And it was um, in zine terms, at least it was very successful and it got me some freelance writing gigs and those gigs sort of snowballed to the point where I was able to quit my job in book publishing and become a full-time freelance writer. That was in uh, 1996. So I'm coming up on the 25th anniversary of that actually. Oh yeah. Um, uh, yeah, which I'm ex kind of excited about, like 25 years, I guess that experiment, maybe it worked. So maybe far, so worked. good anyways. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I spent much of the 90s writing mainly for business and design magazines mm -hmm. uh, about consumer culture. And then somewhere along the way there, I realized I could take that same filter of that sort of excruciatingly detail oriented filter and obsessive kind of approach to how we perceive the world around us mm -hmm. and apply it to sports. And so, um, now during this January, whole time, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but no. during this whole time when you were writing, uh, for the zines and uh, focusing on consumer goods, did you always still have that sort of personal love for the, uh, uniform aesthetics, uh, when watching? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that never stopped. And I, you know, I, you could go back through my personal history and like find all my ex-girlfriends who, who said, yeah, oh yeah, like watching a game with Paul, he'd be like pointing and saying like, why is that guy's sleeve longer than the other guy's sleeve? Or like, look at his stirrups or, or whatever. Like that ne <laughs> I never got that out of my system. Uh, and, and so I realized at some point that it was, it was something I was obsessed with but hadn't written about. And that I was trying to expand my parameters in terms of what I was interested in and what I could express through writing and journalism. And no one had ever really written about uniforms on a consistent basis before. Like, as we both know, there's articles here and there scattered out through generations worth of sports writing, but not like on a consistent basis. And I had written for a bunch of design magazines by this point. And so I, I certainly could have approached some of them and said, hey, why don't we do a, a design column about sports? But what I wanted instead was to create a sports column about design. And I wanted to create a new sports beat and have, and have it taken seriously as sports journalism. And so uh, on New Year's Day, 1999, I made the first and still only New Year's resolution of my life, which was to create and place this column, um, this idea that I had, because it had been rattling around in my head at that point for about a year. And it had, be it had become one of those things that I thought about, but didn't actually act upon. Mm -hmm. And I don't like it when, when that's happening to me. And so I sort of, as a way of making myself do it, I, I made this New Year's resolution. And so... I approached uh, ESPN, the magazine, which at the time was um, a fairly new venture. I think they had launched in 97 and this was early 99. And they, they said, no, and they didn't really get it. And they said, no, nah, I don't think so. For so those who then don't I went get to... it, ESPN magazine. Yeah, yeah. Although of course I ended up later working for ESPN. Oh, spoiler alert, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so then I went to Sports Illustrated and they were very interested. And they said, yeah, we like this idea. And I ended up writing two pieces for them that never ran because they, in each case, they said something more important came up as if there could be something more important. Exactly, right? <laughs> uh, and they paid me for those pieces, but they didn't publish them. And then I remember I was covering another story, like a design story mm -hmm. somewhere in Manhattan when I, I heard about uh, the news that Major League Baseball wanted to put the Spider-Man ads on the bases. Remember that story? Yeah, and yeah. and, and and I thought, oh, this is perfect. This is my beat. It's not uniforms, but it's, you know, it's close enough. Right. It's, and, and I thought, this is why I'm writing for Sports Illustrated now to cover a story like this. And I called my editor and he said, yeah, we've got one of our baseball guys on that. Oh. <laughs> and, and after having already, you know, had the two other stories bumped, yeah. I could see like, all right, like they're not taking this very seriously. They're not taking me very seriously. Mm -hmm. And... And I, so I said, you know what, maybe we, maybe this isn't a good fit. 
And I set my sights lower and I went to the Village Voice, which was an alt weekly paper in New York City, which at the time had a very hip sports section full of things like a column about just about hockey fights <laughs> and uh, which, you know, stuff that now would just be a blog or a, yeah. a YouTube channel or like it wouldn't seem remarkable in the Internet era. But in 1999, it was a pretty remarkable sports section. Right. And it was just a few pages and it was buried in the back of the paper with the phone sex ads. And I uh, I called their editor and I was lucky he was familiar with some of my other work, my non-sports work, and he got it right away. And that's how UniWatch was born. And so uh, I never really thought it would last this long. Mm -hmm. uh, I tend to think of work in terms of projects, like a project that last a few years or until yep. it seems like it's run its course. Uh, but UniWatch has proven to be a surprisingly durable project. And that's a really way too long answer to your question. I, saw. <laughs> I You know, I don't even remember the question I asked, but that's okay. It was a good story. <laughs> I liked it. I loved it. Uh, and for uh, some of the listeners here who perhaps uh, aren't old enough to remember this, but back in the pre-UniWatch uh, sportslogos.net days, uh, uniform coverage, logo coverage was seen as a, as a bit of an afterthought or even a joke. Uh, it certainly wasn't taken seriously. And uh, I just remember being so frustrated, you know, like reading an article about a new logo or uniform and it would just be thrown in as, as a mention, like in the last paragraph, the whole article would be, for example, oh, here's the season ticket prices and how dare they rise the, raise the prices. And oh, by the way, they also unveiled a new logo. And, uh, you know, any reporter back then who was covering these things would, 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 treat it as a joke. They'd say, oh, you know, here we are wasting our time. We mm -hmm. could be signing players and, and they're distracting us with a, a new uniform, a fashion show. I feel like that's true to a certain degree with some uh, broadcasters, even today, that they, when they mention the uniform, they do it almost apologetically. Like that, that like, I can't believe I'm actually saying this, but, and, and yeah, it's frustrating. It's, it's, it's condescending, it's diminishing. And, um, it, it, yeah, it's something I, I feel like I fight, fight against a lot and that I'm sure you've had, like that we've had to sort of fight for the legitimacy of this beat. And, um, but it's, it's a fight worth having. <laughs> well, and the uh, culture seems to be changing with that. Uh, there seems yeah, to yeah, it's certainly better than it used to be, yeah. And uh, as, as our readers grow up and enter the uh, working world and start making the decisions, thank you very much, by the way, for helping change the uni world. <laughs> uh, like I, I can recall, uh, you know, being mentioned a sports center in TSN and, uh, you know, according to sportslogos.net and just as an aside, after the story, the co-host goes, there's a whole website about sports logos. Just the, how could such a thing exist? But fortunately the other co-host uh, chimed in and said, yeah, it's awesome. I'm there all the time. <laughs> I still get that sometimes from not so much people in media, but people yeah. just you encounter in the, the regular world, you know, what right. do you do for a living? Well, I'm a writer. Well, what do you write about? Well, <laughs> dot, dot, dot. And, and people say, really, you can, you can make a living or have a career just on doing that. I'm sure you get the same thing. Sure, uh, yeah. the, the funny thing is when I started at the Village Voice, I was, I was doing, it was a short column then. It was like 400, 500 words every four weeks. So <laughs> it, it wasn't a lot of content. And I remember when I approached my editor, he, the guy, he totally got it, but he said, are you sure there's enough to write about every four weeks? Oh man. Like, and honestly, I didn't know cause I'd never done it. And, and I said, well, I, I think so. Think, think about then, how long that ticker would be, Paul. Yeah, <laughs> um, it, yeah, it was, a, it was sort of a different format then. Uh, and then when I, I left the Village Voice because they actually got rid of their sports section in 2003, and that could have been the end of UniWatch. And instead I decided, yeah, I think I, I'm not done with this yet. And I, I called around and I approached some places and I ended up at Slate.com, which was great for me because it, it was, you know, Slate was and still is an online only publication. And at The Voice, we had basically copied pasted my my print content onto the voice website but I wasn't writing it for the internet you know I wasn't including links and things like that and uh, at slate they said well you know things move faster online you can't write every four weeks you know we need it every two weeks and I said sure and, he, and the editor said Is, can you actually do that is there enough to cover and I said I I think so and then after <laughs> huh? 
I'm sensing a theme. You're, you're, yeah, you're, yeah. And then a, a year after that, I ended up at ESPN.com because Slate turned out to be, it was fine for what it was, but I really wanted to be with a, a real sports venue. And by that time, I knew I had some fans and readers at ESPN, and I arranged for one of them to get me to talk to an editor there. And, and I, I made the jump to ESPN.com where I worked for 15 years. And the, when the guy hired me, he's like, so yeah, how about every week? Uh, like that's because that's, you know, if we're going to establish you as a voice, we, we need it like every week. Can you actually do that? Is there enough to, you know? <laughs> and I said, oh yeah, I, I, I think so. And then two years after that came the launch of the Daily Uni Watch blog, which was when I realized that there were some readers who couldn't wait a whole week for the next ESPN column and that there was also content out there that, what I was learning along the way was that the more content I put out, the more I got back from my readers, from my incredible readers who give me, you know, while we're sitting here talking, you and I, Chris, they, I'm sure both of us are getting tweets and emails and all sorts of tips and observations and, hey, look what I found in an old newspaper or whatever uh, of amazing content. And the more I put out there, the more I got back. And I realized that okay, maybe I can do a daily blog. And ESPN said, yeah, you can do that. You know, just save the big stories for us. And, and I thought, can I actually do this every day? I, I think so. So yeah, it's, uh, that is definitely the theme for sure. Well, sure. Uh, and so, so yeah, when, when, you hear, when you hear these people who say like, can you actually do that for a living? Or like, uh, I can't believe I, like, I even have to talk about this. It's not that important. Uh, it's, a, it's a surprisingly deep rabbit hole I like to tell people. Well, like I, I'm noticing like, over time, right? There's more things to talk about too, because you know there's more specialty uniforms being worn. There's more one-off patches, more memorial patches, for example, alternate uniforms. And as the audience grows, there's more people out there. The internet's bigger; it's a bigger world, and there's there's always something for us to talk about. Uh, even when sports were shut down for three months, uh, which was rough, but we still both found something to talk about. Uh, I I actually found that period really interesting. Um, yeah. I. Because I, I like to do a lot of historical stuff. Uh, like when you say there's, oh, there's a lot of alternate uniforms, there's a lot of patches. There's also a lot of history and there's so much of it that hasn't been documented. And when you think you know, you know the story and then it turns out you know, somebody finds an old newspaper article or magazine clipping or whatever. And it, it just, a lot of stories just have not become part of the oral history or part of the institutional memory of, of sports. You know, certain ones have, but others haven't. And uh, so there's a lot of old stories still waiting to be told. And so, yeah, I found that that period. I mean, obviously the pandemic was horrible and, and having everything shut down and, and people at teams and stadiums out of work was, was terrible. But from a creative standpoint, I found it really interesting, like just doing old you know, stories about history or about what people are collecting or, you know, DIY projects like there was there was. I found it almost liberating to a certain degree not to have to worry about like the latest stupid alternate uniform that Nike dropped or whatever it might have been. Uh, and and I, I was thinking like, how long could I do this? How long could I just keep producing content if no games are being played? And I think I, what I decided, and it, I'm not sure, like it's not like I had a formula to come up with this, but I'll stick to it. I think about two years, I think I could go about two years like creating daily content even with no new games being played. And uh, it, it, it was interesting to sort of, as an exercise to have to do yeah. that. Uh, similar to that, like the book that I wrote with, with Todd Radom, uh, Fabric of the Game, uh, possibly available now, who knows? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's selling out everywhere, folks. This is a good problem. For people who don't know, Chris and Todd uh, have a, a book on the, the visual history of hockey and hockey right. uniforms. So. Uh, yeah. The names, logos, like, what's the, what is the name of my book, Paul? <laughs> the stories behind the names, logos, and uniforms of the NHL's teams. Right. Um, doing those that that research too, like exact same thing you're talking about. You can do historical pieces, uh, and that's pretty much what the book was. And I was still working on the book when the pandemic hit, so I was doing a lot of the that research, uh, going back and and reading old newspaper articles from the 1910s, which is just so much fun. And, and then you find these little nuggets of information that you'd never ever heard before, and you almost feel like a, an explorer from the 16th century finding new land, right? Like we can't go find new land, but I can find out uh, that a team wore a weird color scheme for half a season back in 1934 that we never knew about before. Or the story, like uh, one story we found that we really loved was that the Chicago Blackhawks said they were going to change the name to the Yankees back in the 1930s. And, and that was just like, 
what blew my mind. And uh, if we weren't writing that book, that would have been uh, one of the stories we did. But uh, similar to you, um, during the, the sports shutdown, uh, when NFL teams weren't releasing new logos and uniforms, which, by the way, was fantastic, because otherwise, I don't know if the site would still be running right now. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, it, it forced me to uh, get a little creative. Um, we started doing uh, polls, like a every team's logo history bit by bit. And then, Hey, let's all get together and finally decide once and for all, what's the best Milwaukee Brewers logo of all time, for example. Uh, I mean, obviously it's the ball and glove. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first example I could think of, but my goal, like you, you said you had two years worth of worth of content. I felt I had maybe two, three years worth of teams that I could do a poll on. And maybe that would have got old after a while, I'm sure. But uh, that was sort of, okay, I need something. So here's my crutch. Let's do polls every day for a few, a few months. But fortunately, uh, sports came back and uh, at least that part of life got a little bit better yeah. for us all. Um, I should probably ask you a few questions now. Me, well, it, it, either we're doing uh, you and I both talking about ourselves in this episode or we're doing a half like, you know, Paul today and then Chris next episode. Uh, what are we up to in time here? Probably about. Uh, I'd say we're about halfway through. Sure. Okay. Well, then that's a good time to uh, yeah. switch over. If you had, did you have another pressing question for me? Uh, pressing? No, I'm I'm okay. I mean, uh, okay. well, we'll have, you'll you'll we get a, a second of episodes. We're going to do many episodes. And okay. Uh, <laughs> what I, I had for you actually the same initial question you asked of me. What's your earliest memory uh, of being interested in sports logos? A sort of you know, light bulb moment or an aha moment, or just that sort of some button got pushed in your early brain saying, oh, I'm really into this. Uh, the earliest memory I have of really focusing on a uniform and sort of realizing that everyone else around me doesn't seem to care so much as much as I do on this, uh, the very first sporting event I ever went to. So I imagine I must've had an interest before this. I just don't remember it, but my dad took me to an OHL hockey game, which is uh, a major junior hockey league up in Canada. Uh, and it was, we were visiting my grandparents over Easter in Cornwall, Ontario, which is uh, close to Ottawa, close to the Quebec border, uh, up by Messina, New York for you Americans. And uh, he, he, he stole me away from the family and said, come on, we're going to a hockey game. Uh, and it was the, the Toronto Marlboros versus the Cornwall Royals, okay? <laughs> And I had no idea who these teams were, right? Like this was, I think, 1988, 1989. And turns out it was a playoff game. Um, and I get to the arena and the Toronto Marlboros uniforms, they were owned by the Maple Leafs. So they were those 1980s style Maple Leaf uniforms with the big blue sleeves on either side and then the leaf in the middle. And on the logo, instead of the words Toronto Maple Leafs, there was like a big crown, like a like a Duke's crown, which is they're named after the Duke of Marlborough. And um, I thought that that crown was only visible if you were at the game in person. <laughs> and I thought I was watching the Toronto Maple Leafs. So I was like, okay, so that's the Maple Leafs. And you can only see that crown if you're actually there watch watching it live. <laughs> and when you watch it on TV or look at a hockey card, the crown changes to the words Toronto Maple Leafs. And I was just convinced that this was fact. Uh, I went and I told all my friends at school about this fact that they don't know about. <laughs> and the looks I got, how, how crazy I must have been uh, perceived as. Uh, did, you, did you say anything to your dad? Yeah, I was mentioning it. I was like, oh, it's the Maple Leafs. They don't have, you can only see the crown, you know, when you're here. And he's like, yeah, okay. You know, he's just, <laughs> whatever, Chris. Um, and uh, we lived in Toronto at the time. So uh, I was cheering for Toronto. And um, the Marlboros lost the game 12 to three and uh, they were knocked out of the playoffs. That was the deciding game. I think first round of the playoffs. And right after the game, the team moved <laughs> to uh, they became the Hamilton Dukes. And now they're the, uh, the Guelph storm, I think still playing today. So that was sort of my rough introduction into <laughs> not only logos, but also sports in this team that, oh, oh, this is my new favorite team. And by the end of the day, they had, been eliminated and relocated and that was it <laughs> so but from there you know oh okay i noticed that logo and then at home it's looking at the baseball and hockey cards 
uh, especially older hockey cards, uh, which was the only way to see an old logo back then was to if you could find a hockey card from the 70s and uh discovering like that the uh the vancouver canucks just had a hockey stick on their on their logo mm -hmm. and laughing at it and saying how absurd right and right and uh, and then you know showing it to my dad and saying hey uh uh, uh why do the canucks just have a hockey stick for a logo that's kind of dumb and he would go well that's not just a hockey stick that is the letter c for canucks <laughs> like, oh okay and he's like and you know the brewers logo he's like yeah it's a baseball glove that's an m and a b oh <laughs> and oh, so your father was actually very logo aware like more so than the average parent i would say i, I guess so but you know i didn't see that as unusual at the time i <laughs> just assumed everyone was like this but now as as i go into this maybe my dad did have more of an interest and, uh, you know, and then from there, I, I hear the same stories from him over and over again. Oh, you know, I went and I saw the Atlanta Flames once. Oh, I, I went to a Colorado Rockies game. And uh, oh, uh, uh, the California Golden Seals wore white skates, right? And you hear the same stories over and over. And then uh, you, you sort of become uh, obsessed with it. And you want to go back and find out as many old logos and uniforms as you can. Again, there was no website about this. There was no... You couldn't just go to Google and type in a team name and there it was. It, I, I discovered these as I went along and going through old magazines and, okay, what team is that? Read the caption. Oh, I had no idea the Cleveland Cavaliers wore, you know, burgundy and gold uniforms in the 70s. And that's how I learned reading an old magazine. And, you know, just from there, the, the interest grew and grew and grew. And uh, eventually, uh, as I got older and uh, I always had a, a huge interest in computers, and my dad was a, a computer systems analyst at a company in Toronto. Um, you know, six, seven years old, writing computer programs. You can sort of see where the two interests are starting to merge. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the time the internet comes around, I want to figure out how to make a website. I think I was 13 when I made my first website uh, in 1996. The Sports Logos website started in 1997 when I was 14. And, you know, it, it just grew from there. Into the juggernaut we know today. The juggernaut, the, yeah. the sports logo juggernaut. And were you, then, were, yeah, sorry, were you interested, ahead. well, you said sports logos. Were you interested in other kinds of logos as a kid as well? Like, you know, product, just, just consumer brands and things like that, or only sports logos? Uh, to a lesser extent. I, I know one thing I noticed, and this is sort of a, a Canada only thing, and that is that... Uh, not so much now, but back then in the 80s and 90s, an American company that had, uh, you know, a presence in Canada, they would add a maple leaf to their logo. So <laughs> at, I would notice those maple leaves. I'd try to find them. Like uh, you still see it today on the McDonald's logo anywhere in Canada. There's a big maple leaf right in the middle of the M. Really? Yeah. I had no idea. Wow. I guess that's supposed to trick you into thinking they're Canadian. I don't know. I mean, I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we're falling for it. But Arby's, I believe the apostrophe between the Y and the S used to be a maple leaf instead of the apostrophe. <laughs> uh, I know the Sears logo had a big maple leaf just sort of slapped on the end of it. So I would try to find those maple leaves. And that was sort of the only interest I had in corporate logos. Um, as companies would change logos, I would notice it. And I would tell friends at school because those are the only ones I talked to. It's like, oh, hey, uh, you remember when uh, Sears used to be called Simpsons up here? And they'd be like, what? What are you talking about? I just want to play baseball. Uh, leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it wasn't until I got the, uh, the internet and had that outlet where, you know, I actually discovered that there was guys like you and I out there uh, <laughs> who actually cared about this stuff just as much as we did. Uh, speaking of Canada, you are Canadian, obviously, and the Montreal Expos logo is sort of famously inscrutable. Like as recently as last week, I got a, you know, someone on Twitter was asking me, what does that mean? What does it stand for? And, and uh, you know, my whole career, people have been asking me that question. Uh, what did it mean to you growing up? Like, did you understood, understand the symbolism of it? Did you project or sort of cook up your own idea of what it stood for? Uh, and if you know, like, what do other Canadian sports fans think of it? Because it is such a unique logo. And I, I can tell you growing up, I just thought it just, I just learned it was the Expos logo and that it, it looked sort of slick and cool and very designy, like something about it just seemed very, I guess, professional or something like that. I, I, it's, it's hard to explain, but I, 
I, I just accepted that that was the Expos logo, but I had no idea what it meant or what, you know, that there were letter forms hidden within it or anything like that, aside from the E, obviously. Right. Uh, yeah. I, just like you, I get those, uh, those uh, Twitter questions all the time. People think it's a CLB or a CJB or a, an ELB. And uh, that's not what it is at all, of course. Um, I never had that moment where I wondered what it was because, and this might not be a surprise based on my earlier story, my dad pointed it out to me, <laughs> <laughs> that this was an EMB for Expos, he, he would say Expos de Montreal Baseball, which translates to Montreal Expos Baseball in English, forgive my, my French, French accent there, but um, it, I always saw it as an MEMB, just I, I never saw it as anything else. It was, again, one of those facts I would share around the playground. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the pinwheel cap, again, something else that a lot of this is going back to my dad. But we're I mean, we're going back to when I was seven, eight years old. And really, you know, who else is there at that age? Uh, and, you know, he, he would say, you know, oh, I went to Expo 67 in Montreal. And that's what the Expos are named after. And that's why it's a pinwheel, because it's like a carnival uh, atmosphere and uh yeah so uh in canada uh, the expos logo it's sort of dwindling in importance now I i've noticing as time goes on um which is a shame uh the expos were never more popular than they were maybe about five years ago up here uh when they actually oh, really? played yeah when they actually played uh you know they weren't taken very seriously uh, and i'm speaking as someone who lives in English Canada, I can't speak for what it was like in Quebec. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as uh, the rest of Canada is concerned, you know, we're very uh, Blue Jays focused. Uh, right. It doesn't hurt that, you know, a couple of World Series championships versus the Expos who were sort of never quite cracking through. Uh, you know, they knocked on the door a few times. The strike in 94 certainly didn't help. But, you know, even up to that point, you know, there wasn't a lot of Expos stuff out there. Um, I had an Expos cap. My dad took me to an Expos game in 91 and, you know, I, I bought the cap and uh, that was seen as unusual, you know, walking around <laughs> Ontario with a Montreal Expos cap. Uh, uh, cert certainly uh, not so much now, but uh, back then. And, you know, they left. Uh, nobody really seemed to care that much. And, you know, as time goes on, nostalgia creeps in. And yeah. uh, now we want them back. We want Tampa Bay to come back up, even for half. <laughs> Uh, one thing that's always interesting to me is how some websites have the domain name as basically part of the site name. Mm -hmm. And your site is one of those uh, sportslogos.net. Like nobody says sports logos. It's all, even you don't, you say sportslogos.net. <laughs> and so first, how did you end up with, this is like, I, this is very inside baseball, I guess, but how did you end up with .net instead of a .com? And also, um, how do you feel about the domain name? being part of the site name? Like if, if you could do it, if you could go back and start over, would you do that differently? Well, to answer your second question first, uh, I think if I could go back, I might choose a shorter name. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm finding, uh, you know, I, we sponsored a youth hockey team up in my hometown recently. And, you know, they're, they're like, oh, uh, it's too long, right? It's just one long word. We can't even break <laughs> it up onto two lines. And, and then I tried to put it on the back of a, of a baseball cap um, for my slow pitch team, and which is also named sportslogos.net. And you couldn't fit it. It's too long, right? Like it just wraps around the back of your hat. We look like uh, the back of Gerald Saltalamacchia's jersey, right? Like it's... <laughs> It's ridiculous. So I might change that. Uh, I also might, uh, if, if I could go back, maybe I would have removed my name from the website. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, back then it was, oh, I just want to be famous in some form. I, if someone could come up to me and say they recognize my name, that would be a huge thrill. Um, but, you know, now that I have a family and stuff, I'm, I'm okay being a little more anonymous. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> as for the domain name, I did have sportslogos.com for a while. Uh, really? Yeah. Unfortunately, I was 17 years old when I registered it and I didn't have a credit card. So there, <laughs> there was this company back then, they would give you a domain for free if they'd let, if you would allow them to put ads on your site. And sure, why not? Free domain, sportslogos.com. And, uh, you know, when it came up for renewal, they said, okay, it's going to cost something like $18 to renew. And I was like, I don't have $18. I don't have a credit card. I can't do that. And off it went. 
<laughs> and uh, <laughs> it got picked up by a squatter and that's where it's lived ever since. Uh, a friend of mine uh, had sportslogos.net. I, th I think secretly he was going to launch a compet competing site. He just didn't tell me. Seriously? <laughs> but, well, who knows, right? And um, when that didn't come off the ground, he said, here, you can have it, which thank you very much. You know, that's become my my whole life now. Uh, right. I ended up with sportslogos.net. Yeah, it was given to that's me. That's amazing. So you didn't initially register it yourself. Your friend did? Yeah, they read, uh, I had sportslogos.com. Couldn't renew it. I was stuck with like one of those crazy, it was like emblems.tripod.com was the address. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so this buddy of mine who I guess couldn't get the site off the ground said, here you go, have it. Um, I hope I've said thank you for that. I should. <laughs> as, soon, as soon as we're done recording, I'm sending him a message. <laughs> that's a great. That's a great story. You. As you say, the site is like your whole life now, or your whole working life. When uh, when did you make that jump? Because I know you used to have a regular job, but I can't remember what it was. What what did what did you used to do, and when did you make that jump to doing SportsLogos.net full time? Uh, the uh, my full time gig was as a web developer for a, a newspaper company. Uh, it was a, a company that was owned by the Toronto Star. Uh, we ran a website that showed you sort of uh, the weekly circulars, flyers, advertisements that you get in the mail, which, you know, a novel idea back in 2008. Uh, after about three, four years of that, um, we had a bit of a turnover there. I noticed my voice was no longer being heard. And, you know, you start to get frustrated when that happens. No one's listening to you, but what you say ends up becoming reality. Uh, and uh, I noticed that uh, the site was doing better and better with traffic. And I remember having the phone call with my wife in the, in the lobby of the, uh, the building there at work, right in front of the elevators, always turning away and hiding every time, uh, you know, a, a higher up came up <laughs> the elevator, uh, say, telling her that, uh, you know, I really think I got to make this leap. I, I got to take the chance here. Uh, I have the chance to do something special and uh you don't get that opportunity in your life too often to be able to do something like this successfully and uh, she was hesitant at first she spoke with her mother her mother said yes i think that is the right idea uh and uh i, I did it that was august of 2012 um and then a week later a couple of fun things happen uh one was the uh the company laid off a bunch of people and so i missed out on uh a nice severance, which I would have <laughs> had if I lasted a week. And uh, my wife announced that she was pregnant. So that was fun. No, no pressure. No, no. <laughs> well, that's what it is. No pressure. Yeah. But, but also um, no job. <laughs> and now here comes a kid. Right. But you had this job you have, but, but that's you had right. the pressure. It, there was more pressure on you to, to produce and to, you know, and maybe it worked, but it, it certainly uh, led to uh, where we are now. Yeah. So like eight and a half years later. Yes, eight um, and a half years later. Would you say this is your dream job? Are you living your dream job? I guess so. Uh, this is a job that didn't exist when I was young enough to have a dream job. Right. Uh, I did always want to be in journalism in some form. Um, I was terrible at English classes in high school, so I never had the, the prerequisites to take any sort of journalism or English major in college or university. Uh, so I, I guess in a way I just sort of invented my own media outlet, mm -hmm. uh, hired myself as the sole uh, journalist, <laughs> sole reporter, and was able to spin that into, you know, other writing jobs, right? So I've been able to write for NHL.com. Mm -hmm. I wrote for the Buffalo News for a while. Um, and I wrote a book. So yeah. without any, like yourself, without any journalist uh, training or education, I should say, not training, no education. Uh, I was able to find a way to do what I guess is my dream job. And that was to be a reporter and to be able to do it in sports, you know, that's, that's just bonus and logos specifically, like what is that? <laughs> so, yeah. And, and going to these media events and being able to cover these things, you know, that's, that's always a thrill. And where we often see each other. Yes. Where we do, where uh, probably one of the highlights of my life, my, my life, well, at least my working life. Highlights of my life are children being born. Uh, <laughs> highlights of my professional life um, at the uh, New York Jets unveiling, you and I, uh, and you and I sitting face to face as the entire room is celebrating and partying and enjoying the, the free alcohol. 
you and I there with our laptops out on the same table, just hammering away at our respective stories at the same time. Yeah, bang, banging at our stories. Yeah, it was very like the front page or something where, uh, yeah, like you say, everybody else was, uh, I think I was partaking of a little of the free alcohol anyway, oh, yeah. but, even I, though I was working. As, but, as yeah, any good I, writer does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, we were sitting there trying to get our stories filed uh, because at the time I would, I, I'm trying to think where I, where was I filing to either to sport, Sports I think to Sports Illustrated. Yeah, yeah, I was doing that one for Sports Illustrated. That's and right. You, were you had a photographer. Yeah. Uh, and you had, you had Todd Radom as your- Todd writer. Radom was my photographer. Your I just emailed, photographer. hey, you want to come to this thing? Paul's going to be there. <laughs> and Todd, you know, Todd, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. Uh, and I think Todd took a picture of, well, we'll throw it up on uh, the YouTube Um the, how old am I? I'll throw it up on YouTube uh, of uh, you and I there hammering away with our complimentary beverages. <laughs> uh, I have one more question for you. If, if you could change one thing about one pro level team's logo, and I don't mean like a logo you hate and you just scrap it all together and, and replace it, but like one little detail that bugs you that if you could change it, and just sort of tweak or refine like one little thing that's been under your skin for, you know, however many years, what would it be? And don't tell me you can't think of one because I know you, you have to have some of these. Well, it's, it's going to be one of those things where I have too many. Yes. <laughs> so, okay. I can't just, so I, you're going to have to give me more time to think and I'll get you a good one. The okay, I'll, one I'll, I'll give you one of my own. I'll give you one of my own. All right, well, well, I, I have one that I can throw at you. I just think it might, maybe it's not the, if I could change one thing and it's uniform related. So, okay. All right. right. Go, go for it. Go for it's, it. It's, it's kind of boring guys. So heads up. And to be fair, you said if I could change one thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The Anaheim Ducks uniforms. What I can't stand is that striping they have around the shoulders on their black jerseys. There's an orange stripe for no, absolutely no reason whatsoever that I can tell. And that bothers me to no end. I, I, I just can't stand. I stare at it. I go, that's horrible. Why is that there? Apologies if the designer is listening. I don't understand why that's there. And I know that's not the most exciting answer in the world, but that's the first thing I could think of is that that line has got to go. And that would just make the uniform so much more clean. Paul, save us with your answer. Uh, well, I was asking more about a logo than you, because you're the logos guy. That's all I I, yeah. In one of these sort of, you know, sometimes you see a flaw and then you can't unsee it. Um, and so I, I went through like most of my life looking at Pittsburgh, the Pittsburgh Pirates, watching Pirates games. And at some point, maybe 15 years ago, and I don't know why it took so long, it just sort of hit me that if you look at the, the Pirates P logo, the upper left hand corner of it doesn't have the same sort of point or serif that every other corner or terminus in the letter has and it's it, it bugs me. like it needs it feels out of balance and uh, you know somehow I didn't notice it for all these years and so I didn't care and it was fine and I'm sure everybody's fine with it but it, like once I know it's it's like every time I see it now do you know what I'm talking about do you like uh, I will have to put it, we'll put it in the, the video version of it on the video. I'm picturing it in my head. Uh, I can say it never bothered me, but now that you've mentioned it, it will bother me forever. So yeah. Yeah. Watch for that. Well, <laughs> uh, oh, wow. Is that it for episode one? We're up to that. The might be a, did, did, did you have any other, was there anything you want to revisit with me or any other questions you have for me? Um, I want to save some stuff for future episodes. We, we okay. can't shoot all Fair our enough. notes in one episode. Fair enough. Um, I think this has gone well. I, yeah. I think this went quite well. I hope um, it was enjoyable for the listeners. As much fun as it was for you and I. I, I hope it was uh, for them. Uh, and don't worry, guys. We will like we'll delve into like things like what got what uniforms were released this week or what was the big uniform news of a given week. But there's also going to be a lot of this where Chris and I just talk and um, you know discuss uh, things uh, that are rattling around in our heads. Yep. Um, and I, I think that's uh, that's going to be interesting. It's going to be a scary ride a little. Um, and we all, we'll also want feedback. Yes. Um, and so I'm hoping in, but <laughs> in future episodes, we'll be able to 
uh, direct you toward uh, a Twitter account that we don't yet have, uh, or an email address that we don't yet have for this show, <laughs> where you can uh, send up uh, send questions to us, and maybe we'll have like a question of the week or something along those lines, um, yeah. and where where people submit questions to us. Um, it's just something. I don't, actually, Chris, you and I have not discussed that, and I'm we just, are we are hammering it out as we are recording this. Actually, this is yeah yeah. <laughs> in real time people. So, uh, but that's just something that it occurred to me that it would be a, a good way to sort yep. of uh, engage with the audience. Uh, and maybe we'll have guests sometimes and uh, all we're all very much making it up as we go. But I, I, I think we've laid a good foundation today. Yep, for sure. Uh, yeah, episode one, this was just sort of a way to uh, introduce ourselves, I guess, for those unfamiliar. Uh, and yeah, we will be focusing on logos and uniforms. Don't worry, we will think of <laughs> a fun topic that we could all talk in dig deep into and explore and complain about and have lots of fun with. This is just the first of many, right, Paul? Uh, we hope so. Hope that, so. That, that is the plan. All right. First episode of Unified in the Books. Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank Thanks you, to all our listeners and our audience. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.